Thank you, Hallie, and thank you for all the work you've done to make this morning possible. Good morning. Good morning. We are so delighted to have you all here at this early morning, and I can't tell you how impressed I am that everybody is in their seats, on time, ready to go. It is just not how Washington typically works. But we're absolutely delighted to be here, and thank you all so much for joining us this morning. Um, this is the culminating event for EPA's Women's Histories Month, which focused, as so much of what we do at EPA does, on expanding the conversation on environmentalism. Today, you will hear from women leaders who work at the White House and at EPA about the agency's work and the Obama administration's accomplishments. But of course, if this is to be a conversation, there has to be more than one side. And we are here to listen to you, to understand your concerns, and we hope, by the end of the day, to encourage you and through you other women leaders as well to enhance your efforts to protect the environment, public health, and our communities. As I said, we are very excited about this event. It's been in the planning for a long time. We are thrilled to be able to bring together so many extraordinary women leaders during Women's History Month to discuss how we can work together. The women in this room come from across the country. You are the executives of multinational companies and major nonprofit organizations. You are small business owners, lawyers at prominent firms, sole practitioners, consultants, soccer moms, community leaders, and the list goes on. And many of you are more than one thing in those categories. <laughs> I understand there's someone here who is even a race car driver. So, hey, there we go. Um, we work in different fields but we all share the desire to improve the world around us and to protect the future for our children and the generations that follow. So the conversations we'll be having are sure to be productive, and we all hope they will lead to a renewed commitment to make a difference on the many significant environmental challenges we face. To that end, I think all of you were given an assignment to think about the most important environmental issue that you believe we will face over the next three to five years. Please write that issue on the post-it that's in your folders, and you will all be asked to be prepared to discuss that issue during today's breakout sessions. As I speak of women leaders, I would of course be remiss if I did not note that at EPA we have the great privilege of working under the leadership of one of what we know to be this country's most impressive and inspiring women. Administrator Lisa P. Jackson. And I'm not saying that just because she's my boss. <laughs> we are lucky to have strong and accomplished women in leadership positions throughout the EPA and throughout the entire Obama administration. And many of them will be here today to speak with us. On that note, I would like to introduce our first two distinguished speakers. We are fortunate to be joined by two powerful and extraordinary leaders of the Obama administration. Ms. Valerie Jarrett serves as White House Senior Advisor and Assistant to the President for Intergovernmental Relations and Public Liaison. Prior to joining the Obama administration, Ms. Jarrett was the Chief Executive Officer of the Habitat Company, a real estate development and management company. After graduating from the University of Michigan Law School, she practiced at two law firms, joined the Daly Administration, where she became the Deputy Chief of Staff and Commissioner of Planning and Development for the City of Chicago. She was the Chair of the Chicago Transit Board and of the Board of Trustees of the University of Chicago Medical Center. She was Vice Chairwoman of the Board of Trustees of the University of Chicago and a trustee of Chicago's Museum of Science and Industry, and a mom. <laughs> Ms. Tina Chen, my good friend Tina, um, our daughters go to the same uh, uh, high school. We have ninth graders, so you know what we're going through. <laughs> yes, we've are, we're on our second shift today, having getting these kids out to school. Ms. Tina Chen serves as the assistant to the president and chief of staff to the first lady. Prior to joining the Obama campaign and the administration, 
Ms. Chen was a partner at the Chicago office of Skadden, Arp, Slate, Meager, and Flom. Whoever knew the last three names? <laughs> where she worked for 23 years in corporate litigation representing public agencies, including the Illinois Department of Child and Family Services and the Chicago Housing Authority. Valerie and Tina worked together to lead the White House Council on Women and Girls. Valerie is the council's chair and Tina as the executive director. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Valerie Jarrett and Ms. Tina Chen. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. We are so delighted to have you here. What a perfect way to start a Monday morning. And Diane, thank you for that introduction. It was a pleasure to be over at EPA. Uh, Administrator Jackson invited me to come over as we were celebrating Women's History Month and address her team, and the room was full of um, amazing women, and we actually there had a few good men who showed up as well. And I see my one good man, my chief of staff, my head of counselor is in the back, Mike Stratmanis. So uh, we do the same over here, but thank you. And thank you for mentioning my daughter. Um, my daughter's 26, and for those of you who have young daughters, I promise you eventually they do grow up. And uh, they even reflect back and go, you know, you were right about a few of those things that you said, but it takes, it takes a while to get them there, as I say to Tina on a regular basis. But we are thrilled to have you here, and we're so fortunate to have uh, an administrator of the EPA who is not only smart and compassionate and passionate and dedicated, uh, but she also really appreciates the unique role that the EPA can play in the lives of women and girls. And so for Tina and for me, that is so important in our role as chairing the, as running the Council on Women and Girls. And just briefly, the Council was created by the President uh, really very shortly after he took office. And I think uh, people say, well, why did he do it? And I say, well, you have to understand, this is a man who really has lived his life surrounded by women. Uh, he had a mother, single mom, who worked so hard to provide for both the president and for uh, his sister, and she had to travel away from home and leave him for years, literally, with his grandparents as she pursued her career. She struggled during a part of her life. She was dependent on food stamps, and so he saw firsthand how she struggled, and then he watched his grandmother, who worked for a bank and was an officer at a bank, but she trained men year after year who then leapfrogged above her. And so I think growing up with those role models gave him a sense of um, appreciation for the plight of women. And then being married to this very uh, dynamic and strong and smart uh, wife who also struggled with work-life balance and trying to make sure that they were raising their daughters uh, to be healthy and to grow up in a world where they could compete on an even playing field, I think that life experience really prepared him for uh, an appreciation of what he could do as president to improve the quality of lives of women and girls. And so the council was created for the first time representative of representing ha um, every aspect of our administration, every department, every agency has someone who sits on our council. And our goal is simply that, to figure out how through our policies and our programs and legislation that we can move forward the quality of lives for women and girls. And, not only that, we have a really good time. And it's so nice to see people from across the administration coming together and really looking at issues from the perspective of the people we serve as opposed to just from the federal government. And we are looking at how we can collaboratively across the administration tackle issues that are so important to women and girls. And so it's been a terrific three years and we're always looking at new ways of expanding the work of the council. And one of the ways that we do that is through engagement. And so we're delighted to have you here with us today. We look forward to hearing your ideas and sharing best practices among ourselves and to figure out what else we can do within the space of the environment that just uh, makes our environment better. And so when, when all of your girls and boys grow up, it's in a better world. And it's about as simple as that. So with that, I'm going to introduce to you uh, my partner in this effort, Tita, who I have known, I don't know, Long enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when it starts to get up lines of 20, you want to, like, I don't want to admit, everybody always jokes about the president's gray hair. My gray hair is not that funny. <laughs> and I feel like when I met Tina, I had no gray hair whatsoever. So certainly 
we are aging gracefully in place, but um, <laughs> it, has, it has really been such a thrill to have Tina. Uh, we both left Chicago. We both took this leap of faith to join the administration. It has been such a privilege to serve this president uh, and the First Lady, and to have people like the Administrator Jackson and Tina joining in this effort just makes every day a pinch me day. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Tina for a few remarks. So, thank you, Valerie, um, and welcome to the White House. Um, and we want to really especially welcome, you know, um, Administrator Jackson and Diane Thompson, who have been just so terrific at the EPA. They are both, you know, great role models, I think, for women um, and, um, you know, all people across the country. Um, but they especially, you know, live every day at the EPA, what we've been trying to do through the Council on Women and Girls, and that's to carry out the President's directive to all of the federal agencies, which is to say everything that every part of the federal government does touches the lives of women and girls in some way, whether it's the people who work at the agencies um, and or whether, you know, especially in the topic of the day today, um, in how the policies and the programs of the EPA affect women and girls throughout the country um, and really around the world as well. So the EPA has really just been champions at doing that from day one in the administration and we are so grateful for their leadership and partnership in this effort. Yeah, absolutely. But we really cannot do it. One of the things we've learned in the last three years is how, you know, really small the White House is. <laughs> as big a footprint as it casts, um, you know, as we get our message out and as big as the megaphone might be, um, the physical space is really pretty small and the amount of people that we have here to do this work is really small. Um, one of the people, I want to make sure she was up here at the front, but I want to acknowledge she really put today together from the White House end is Hallie Schneier. And Hallie directs our... Hallie is the Director of Women and Girls Outreach here in our Office of Public Engagement, so she's really the glue that connects us to all of you because we cannot do the work that we have here, both the policy work, the program work, and importantly, the work of making sure that people across the country know and understand these issues and know and understand how the administration is working to improve the environment um, for all people across the country um, without all of you, without all of you actively participating and carrying that message across because we really don't have arms and legs across the country. You are our arms and legs. I also want to give you greetings from my boss, the First Lady. Um, you are here at a terrific day for us, one of our very, very, very special days in the White House. Um, it's garden planting day. <laughs> so this afternoon, this afternoon, the First Lady will be out on the South Lawn um, with about 35 children um, uh, from across the country this time, for the first time this year, um, in addition to um, two kids from Bancroft and um, Tubman Middle Schools here in D.C., uh, we actually went through and combed our letters, and we get these amazing letters, um, from, cards and letters from moms and kids all the time into the First Lady talking about how the Let's Move initiative to end childhood obesity in a generation has really changed their lives in big ways and small. Um, from, you know, moms who write us about kids who have all of a sudden changed their lives and dropped the weight and gone, you know, are active in sports and activities and their self-esteem has gone up, um, to the kids who will be with us today. And we have kids from a Girl Scout troop from upstate New York. Um, that's been growing um, plants you know, to sort of give to um, disadvantaged seniors, you know, so that they can have a tomato plant themselves, um, to kids who are building school gardens um, in schools in Iowa, North Carolina, and Pennsylvania, all of whom wrote in about the amazing changes that they're making within the schoolrooms. Um, and that's just one way in which we are trying to, you know, get across to kids how they can affect their environment, be involved in their environment, get their hands dirty. I know the administrator does this with teaching gardens as well. Um, and there's a whole gardening movement that really has taken force to, to learn the many things that kids can to connect not just to the food that they eat and better living, but also to, to their environment as a whole. So we will be out there doing that. Um, and it is great to start the day here with you. And then I'll be out there in my jeans and t-shirts <laughs> in the afternoon getting my hands dirty um, uh, with, with the kids um, and carrying that message across. So thank you again for coming. I know it is um, a sacrifice for all of you to take the time um, to come here. To tra Many of you have traveled. Um, we are very grateful for what you do every day, um, the work that you'll do here today, um, and again for the work of the APA. Thank you so much. Thanks. Have a great day.
other quick housekeeping announcements. We have you kind of squished in here like sardines. Please don't feel like you need to stay like this the whole day. You have a lot of work to do, so if you need to spread out and make yourself comfortable, please feel free to do that. But without further ado, I feel extremely lucky to get to introduce one of the absolute stars of the day and so excited she could make the time to be here with us, Administrator Jackson, if you would mind coming on up. Oh my goodness. Sit down. Uh, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's very nice. We got work to do. Let's have fun. You look beautiful. You look very special. This is a special day. I cannot tell you how happy I am to see us here today on this very important day. Um, I didn't even know it was garden planting day, but it just goes to show you sometimes the stars align and fate. Um, is, in the, is on our side. I need to start, of course, by thanking our first two speakers to take the time with all that's going on. And believe me, there's always more going on than their composure would indicate. Uh, but for Valerie and Tina to be here to welcome you means a lot as well. They're also welcoming you on a day where the headline is that 57% of Americans think that this administration is doing the right things on the environment. So, yay. Before I get started with my short, I promise, remarks, um, I just want to acknowledge what we uh, call within our building four blocks away, the SHEPA. Um, SHEPA, stand up. <laughs> Turn around. Say hello. Yeah, they're, and they're around the room as well, the ones who were too nervous to stand up because they're worried about how the day goes. So it's my job to welcome you here this morning. Um, I just want to say a few words about where I think we've been, about how important environmental protection is, but how critically important women are in terms of where we've been and where we're going. And of course, uh, preach to the choir a little bit about why these issues are so important. Of course, the reason you preach to the choir is that the choir needs to go out and sing. So there is a method <laughs> to our madness, especially now. Now, we know that the impact that women have had on environmental issues is, uh, does, did not start with me or actually any of the women of EPA, going back to our first uh, female leadership. In fact, it started um, back, you know, maybe as early as the 1930s or before. You know, the recorded history of women and environmental issues uh, maybe started in, in the last century with someone like maybe Rosalie Edge, who talked about conservationism and, and conservation at a time when that term wasn't accepted, and she challenged the established notions of what environmental conservation uh, should be. There's all kinds of names that came after, and I, if you name anyone, you, you risk offending all, but um, I can't help but think of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas or Rachel Carson um, when I think about women who have taken slings and arrows and stood up to protect our environment, to be the voice for our environment. EPA has had six women who held its highest office over the course of our now 41-year history, and today, more and more of our employees, more and more of our managers, uh, certainly our scientists, certainly our leadership are women, including the wonderful Stephanie Owens, who hates it when I do this, but deserves so much credit for insisting that we be here today. Thank you. We also have broad support from women who advocate on behalf, not of EPA. I, whenever people say, how can I help EPA? I say, don't. Help health and the environment, help clean air, clean water, clean land. Women, groups like Moms Rising, groups like Mocha Moms, who um, have stood up, especially in this year, because they're concerned about their health and the health of our children. And they've been instrumental in our progress over these last few years. It's been my honor to be a part of the history of women's leadership in environmental health and protection, and to do my small part in trying to move these issues forward. Now, one of the reasons that um, it's so important for us to be here is that women's environmental issues are really women's health issues. You know, chronic health conditions have been linked to air pollution. That link is strong. It's not speculative. It is real. So when you think about things like um, high blood pressure, 
COPD, of course, asthma. They are more common in women over age 50 than in uh, men over age 50. Women are frequent sufferers of heart attack and cardiovascular disease, which is another deadly medical issue linked to pollution in our environment. It's something that affects one of every two women, and cardiovascular disease is the most frequent cause of death of women. And of course, as we all know, women's health is really indistinguishable from children's health when it comes to chemicals in our environment, which can be passed down in the womb and can expose our children at um, a very early age. In the last three years, we have counted on American women and mothers to help us defend ourselves, yes, but really more importantly to tackle proactively the environmental issues and to be a voice that speaks up for the environmental issues most important to you and to Americans. At the end of last year, EPA finalized the mercury and air toxic standards that limits mercury and arsenic, cadmium, acid gases, soot, and smog-forming chemicals from power plants. Mercury is a neurotoxin. It threatens the health of our children. And before the MAT standards were put in place last year, somewhat unbelievably, there was no national standard in this country for how much mercury a power plant could emit. In the year 2011, unlimited amounts of mercury could be emitted. Some states had taken leadership on the issue, but far too many had not. What's even more incredible is that that wasn't for lack of trying. You see, the Clean Air Act called for these mercury and air toxic standards in 1990. With the backing of community groups and moms groups and religious groups and doctors and environmental groups and others, we were able to get the MAT standards done last year. It's a major victory for our health. Once the MAT standards are fully implemented, they will prevent 11,000 premature deaths a year and 130,000 asthma cases and attacks per year. I always think about those numbers, but when I'm in a room like this, I feel confident knowing that I don't have to explain that behind numbers are people. Behind those statistics are a mom who might be able to rest just a little bit easier knowing that her government is doing what it can and should to protect her child from exposure to a dangerous neurotoxin like mercury. Or young people who want to go outside and move but need to know that their government and their parents know that their government is out protecting the, the air that their children will be breathing. MATS is just one item on a list that includes cleaner power plants because we're setting standards to require them to clean up their emissions. Cleaner cars because we've set standards to make cars more fuel efficient and when you burn less fuel, you create less carbon pollution. Healthier waters, water's still the number one environmental issue for so many Americans. And better safeguard, so much work left to be done in terms of chemicals in our products, in our environment. MATS is also one of the things that EPA has done that some people and special interests are actively trying to do away with. I wish I could tell you it was the only thing we've done that's under attack. But once again, we're counting on women to help us carry the message forward that this is not going to fall, that this must not fall. We know that if they take away these health protections, that they are taking away vital protections for women's health. If they make it easier for big polluters to pollute, then they make it harder for women and mothers and their children to lead healthier lives. Ladies, the truth is environmental protection does not happen by accident. Health safeguards, especially these days, are not a given. It takes vigilance. It takes hard work to ensure that those things are protected and passed down to future generations. The same is true of every advance that women have made in our history. It took action, it took bold action, to achieve fundamental things like the right to vote, assurances of equal pay for equal work. And it will take more than a few taps to break all the glass ceilings that remain. The equality we've sought and continue to seek is not something that happens by accident. We have to ensure it. Now, another important part of our success has been the leadership of President Obama. 
I'm proud to serve a president who said that we can't wait on environmental and public health issues. I'm proud to serve a president who knows that EPA and what the work that we do is vital to the American people and who said that the choice between our economy and our environment is a false choice. And I know I can feel extra confident in our president because he's done a little bit of insurance making. You see, he surrounded himself by smart women, brilliant women in the White House, and many of them you've heard from and you will be hearing from, from EPA. So with that, I'm gonna stop speaking and let us all get started. Once again, thank you very much for being here. Thank you for lending your voice. Thank you for all the follow-up that's gonna happen. I'll see you again in a little bit, um, and welcome. See why we think it's so neat to have her as a boss? Thank you, Administrator Jackson. Uh, I'm now pleased to welcome another of the women leaders in the White House, uh, Heather Zeichel. She is the Deputy Assistant to the President for Energy and Climate Change. Prior to joining the Obama uh, for President campaign and the administration, Ms. Zeichel was Legislative Director for Senator John Kerry. She also served as Legislative Director for uh, Congressman Frank Pallone and Congressman Rush Holt. She, Rush Holt. She grew up in Iowa and is a graduate of Rutgers University, and we are so very glad to have her strong and powerful and effective voice in the White House fighting uh, for the issues that uh, we work so hard on. Heather. Thank you. Um, it's not very often on a Monday morning I get to start the day off with such an exciting group of people. So thank you all for being here today. Um, I, uh, I see many friendly faces in the audience, and obviously you've um, heard from some of the most amazing women in the Obama administration. And for me personally, it's such an honor to be able to be part of this team, um, whether it's what we're doing to bring um, health care to more American families or what we're doing to clean up the air and water. We have an, a tremendous uh, legacy as an Obama administration, and we're so excited about um, the, potential, the, the, the potential opportunities in the future. Um, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about who I am and, and how I got here. I actually um, had a start on, on a farm in rural Iowa. Um, yes, I'm probably one of the few Obama administration officials that knows how to milk a cow. But, uh, <laughs> but um, it's served me well. Uh, starting in my very... Uh, <laughs> okay, maybe that wasn't the right pivot point. But... Um, <laughs> But I, uh, I started in, 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 I grew up in, in rural America, and um, my grandfather was a dairy farmer. And from a very young age, I learned the importance of, you know, a, la a land ethic and protection of public health and the environment. My mother was a nurse who spent every day trying to find um, uh, new connections between environmental health and, and uh, between the environment and, and health protection. And so from a very young age, I was uh, instilled with the, 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 uh, the virtues that bring me here today. Um, I found myself deciding at a very young age that I wanted to work on environmental policy and environmental science. And um, at the time, I'm embarrassed to say there were not a lot of universities that even offered such a program. And one of them happened to be at Rutgers University. So, uh, yes, so I, we've, we've all got a funny New Jersey connection. Um, so I ended up finding my way to Rutgers University and working on uh, environmental, uh, environmental policy, which was tremendous. Um, and as I was there at school, I sort of quickly learned the, the connection between fighting for public health and where that crosses with the important people that are in office at the state level, but also at the federal level. And had the um, great opportunity to work on a campaign for a little known congressman that nobody ever thought was gonna get elected. Uh, he was Rush Holt. Um, so everybody loves Rush Holt. <laughs> I mean, with a bumper sticker like, yes, my congressman really is a rocket scientist, you can't really go wrong. Um, so I was lucky enough to come to Washington with him um, and work as his environmental assistant, was serving the New Jersey delegation for a while and then moved north to serve the Massachusetts delegation um, and, and then had the great opportunity um, with 
John Kerry to work on his presidential race, which didn't quite end the way we wanted to, but I got, um, I, I got, I, I, I had some good practice for round two, um, and then served for uh, President Obama on his campaign working on energy and environmental policies. And I'm really pleased to say, standing here today, that all of the things that the President fought for as a candidate, whether it was, you know, tackling climate change, reducing air pollution, transitioning to a clean energy economy, we've been able to accomplish. You know, we're, we didn't get we didn't get 100%, but we got 99.9% .9 of the way there. And we have so many firsts as an administration. If you would have told me coming into office that after three decades of inaction on uh, car standards, increasing the efficiency of our cars and trucks, um, that we would have been able to do it with the UAW, the environmental community, Democrats, Republicans, and all the major auto manufacturers standing behind us to support historic increases in cafe standards, I wouldn't have believed you, but we did it. And that was that was only one of many, many firsts. And it, because of Administrator's Jackson, uh, Administrator Jackson's leadership, we now have the first ever mercury standard on coal-fired power plants that's protecting public health and you know allowing all of us to take our, our, our kids and little brothers and, and sisters fishing and not have to worry about fish consumption advisories. Um, and, you know, it, it doesn't end there. We've had historic investments in clean energy. In just the first um, three years of our administration, we've been able to double the generation of renewable power. Um, that's wind, solar, and geothermal. We've, we've doubled down on research and development. Now we have some of the most efficient batteries in the world. And we're, we're exporting our technologies to countries like China and India. And we're creating the jobs here at home. So across the board, um, we're really excited about what we've been able to achieve and know that we have many more victories ahead of us. Um, one thing, I, I want to spend just a, a few minutes talking about um, the President's energy policies writ large, something that um, you can't really pick up a newspaper today and, and not see. Um, so you've heard from the President directly, and he's certainly a far better messenger than I am, um, but has been, he just, he just uh, wrapped up a two-day tour all across the country. I'm sure many of you saw that press coverage, but talking about his all of the above energy approach. And, you know, we're, we realize that in the near term, um, ongoing responsible domestic oil and gas production is important and despite what many on the other side are saying we have we, uh, oil and gas production has increased every year that this president has been in office but we're doing it now with the most aggressive environmental and safety standards in the world um, the second thing the president always talks about is alternatives we know we need alternatives whether that's clean uh, you know, wind turbines and, and solar, solar panels or some of the um, alternatives to oil that we can run our cars and trucks on, including um, advanced biofuels. We now in this country have four advanced biorefineries. When we came into office, we had none. And, you know, hopefully someday these are going to be the fuels that, that run our trucks, our cars, and our airplanes. Um, and then the last key issue that the President always talks about is energy efficiency. Um, the fastest, cheapest way to address our energy challenges through efficiency. And we have made historic progress both in the built environment and, again, based on Administrator Jackson's leadership uh, in our cars and trucks. And um, our, we're very excited this spring we hit a um, landmark moment in that we weatherized a million homes. Um, these are uh, low-income homes bringing solutions, whether it's a more efficient refrigerator or better insulation. They're saving families on the average of $400 a year. Uh, and behind all that, whether it's the installation or the manufacturing of those uh, more efficient windows and appliances, those are a lot of jobs and, and um, you know, jobs that are here that can't be exported and something that, again, we are very excited about. Um, but it's not just what we're doing in the built environment. As I said earlier, the historic standards for cars and trucks um, are saving consumers money, and those cars and trucks are running, rolling off the assembly line today. Uh, and, and we didn't stop there. We thought, well, hey, heavy-duty trucks have never been, um, have never had a standard for fuel efficiency. So based on um, our conversations with industry, we were able to, for the first time ever, have an efficiency standard there. So all these things are helping reduce our dependence on oil and ultimately, 
you know, the price at the pump, everybody's frustrated when you pull up to the pump and fill your car and you see the number, the price tag going up and up. Unfortunately, if there was some silver bullet, we would have used it, but there's not. Um, so what the president's very much focused on is a long-term strategy that allows us to reduce our dependence on oil. The less we are relying on oil, the more we're protecting our economy from the whims of the global oil market. Um, so those are the things that we're focused on, and those are the things that we know are important. And you know, it's like so many of our policies, we see them as a win-win, a win for the economy, uh, a, a win for the environment, and um, a, a win for the administration, frankly. So we are we, we are um, doing great work, and we really appreciate all the support that everybody in this room has provided. And it, without the women in this administration, we wouldn't have been able to accomplish all those things. So thank you for your time and your dedication, and uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of your morning. Thank you, Heather. That was great. Now everybody needs to take a minute and squirm a little bit and move your chairs apart. And if you need to stand up and stretch, uh, this is the time as we go into uh, transition. Um, we have wonderful leaders at EPA, and we are particularly um, pleased to have so many of our women leadership here uh, to talk with you about the work that they've been doing. And I have the the honor of introducing them. I've been told that um, if I go through their credentials, we'll be here all morning, so I'm not going to be able to do that, even though I usually like to break the rules. I'll find some other rule to break. So um, these folks will share their stories about their work and the impact on everyday people and places, uh, and uh, we'll get on with the business of the day. Moderating both panels will be Bicky Corman who is our Deputy Associate Administrator for Policy. And we will go to the first panel, which will include Nancy Stoner. Nancy, come on up. Nancy is the Acting Assistant Administrator for the Office of Water. Uh, Cynthia Giles is the Assistant Administrator for the Office of Enforcement and Compliance Assurance. Michelle DePaz, the Associate Administrator for the Office of International and Tribal Affairs and Judith Enk, administrator, uh, Regional Administrator for EPA Region 2. This will be our first panel. Vicki? I have to lower it some. Um, thank you very much. It's, it's tremendous to be here. It's wonderful to see all these females in the audience. Thank you. Um, I'll just say quickly, this morning on my way into the building, I've, I've come here quite a bit of time. I've had to show my credentials. I've often gotten stuck trudged up the long stairs, couldn't find the elevator. But this morning on the way up, I was walking behind a woman whose heels were higher than mine, and so she was a little slower, but I caught up with her just as we got to the front door, and this has never happened to me before. The front doors just opened, and I thought, we have come a long way. I mean, it was, it was really amazing. It's a good day for this to be happening. I also want to note, I was born in New Jersey, so I do have a little bit of a New Jersey connection. <laughs> Um, I'm very honored to be able to bring these panelists to you all who we're hoping will tell you something about their experiences with the environment and, and we hope with an emphasis on focusing on issues about how this might bear on women, equal protection and, and the like. Um, first is Nancy Stoner, who I see has 25 years of environmental experience, which I guess means she's younger than me. <laughs> I just learned that. Um, a few weeks ago, it was reported in one of our senior staff meetings that Nancy was out in the hinterlands, and she was described by a local paper as EPA's water lady. And I think that gives you the range of experience and how Nancy is actually reaching out and talking to people about the importance of water quality and quantity. Please go ahead, Nancy. Okay. All right. So uh, I first, I just want to say what an honor it is to be here today with all of you and, uh, and to thank you for everything that you're doing every day uh, 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 in general, 
but specifically on protecting water resources, which is, which is my thing. And uh, they asked us to talk for five minutes. I don't know how many of you have ever tried to talk for five minutes. It's really hard. It's much easier to talk for 30 minutes than it is to talk for five minutes. But what I wanted to do was just touch on a couple of the things that, that we're doing that are part of the administrator's priorities. So um, the three priorities that I'm going to talk about are cleaning up our communities, protecting America's waters, and working for environmental justice. And the things that I'm going to talk about affect all of those, implement all of those. Uh, and, um, uh, and I think I'm going to be in a breakout with a bunch of you later, so I'll get to hear more from you at that time. Um, so, uh, so one of them is the Urban Waters Federal Partnership. And this is actually something that the administrator created herself. And uh, so I got to join it after it was already underway. And it involves 12 federal agencies. And the thing that I like about it the most is that it's really focused on what communities want to do to protect their waters as part of their vision for what their community should be. And uh, so it really isn't uh, uh, a, uh, an EPA program directed at telling people to do something. It's an EPA program to meet people to help figure out how to bring all the federal agencies together to help them do what their community wants to do. And so uh, that's one of the ones I wanted to mention. Uh, we're right now working with seven communities. Obviously, we'd like to work with a lot more. Uh, but that's where we are at this point on that. And that's one of the things uh, that I put on my short list. A second one that I put on my short list was mountaintop mining. Uh, so that is an area that uh, uh, we have been working uh, very hard uh, with, again, a number of federal agencies, uh, including the Army Corps of Engineers, to protect the health of Appalachian families, uh, protect the environment, and particularly protect uh, streams in Appalachia. And, um, and we feel like uh, we're making a lot of progress uh, in terms of uh, protecting particular streams, but most important, protecting the way mining is done uh, so that uh, people don't need to choose between jobs and the environment. Be mining can be done in a way that protects streams. And that's really our focus on how to do that. We're working with the mining companies, with the Army Corps of Engineers, with the communities there to help figure out how it can be done. And, uh, and we're making, uh, I think, big changes that we'll be seeing over time uh, in the mining industry. The third I wanted to mention was advancing green infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And I know that a lot of you in this room, because I know a number of you in this room, are uh, experts in green infrastructure. Uh, but for those of you who don't know what it is, it has to do with uh, protecting natural landscapes and also uh, engineering landscapes to mimic uh, natural functions. And, uh, and uh, one of the things I like about it, even though, of course, water is the most important, as everyone knows, is that it's not just <laughs> about water. It's actually about everything. It's about uh, cleaning the air. It's about addressing climate change. It's about enhancing communities and property <coughs> values. Uh, it's about all of those things. And uh, similar uh, to the urban waters that I started with, uh, what we're doing is partnering, partnering with communities uh, who want to uh, bring green infrastructure into their community. Cynthia and I are working together on uh, an effort uh, to help uh, communities prioritize their investments and using green infrastructure as a big piece of what they will do to address sewer overflow, stormwater pollution, and other things that impair their waterways, but it also can be addressed uh, through these techniques that bring so many other values uh, to their community. And then the last thing I wanted to mention, I probably have already gone over my five minutes, is the Mexico border program. And I wanted to mention it in particular because I think that uh, some people don't understand what the program is and what we're doing. And, uh, and so I want to make sure that you can explain to people what it is. It's not a foreign aid program. This is actually addressing uh, issues on the border that affect Americans. 
Every dollar that we expend in the Mexico border program has to benefit Americans. But what it does is it brings water and wastewater services to people on both sides of the border, and Mexico also puts in uh, funding. Uh, often they've never had those services before. And, uh, and so over the years, and it's been since 1997, the program has provided $571 million to 97 projects that benefit nearly 8.5 million border residents. Uh, and as I said, it leverages other funding. And it has uh, improved public health by providing nearly 55,000 homes with safe drinking water and more than 500,000 homes with wastewater services, redu reducing the risk of waterborne illnesses. So I'm going to stop right there, and I look forward to talking to many of you uh, uh, in the break. Thanks, Nancy. Um, and as a longtime resident now of the District of Columbia, we're very pleased that the Anacostia River is one of those that's being profiled in this Urban Waters Initiative and very glad of the partnership. Um, now introducing Cynthia Giles, who is our Assistant Administrator for Enforcement. Um, Cynthia has 30 years of experience in the environmental arena. Um, as the Assistant Administrator for Office of Enforcement, she is EPA's top cop on the job. And even though shorter than even me, uh, <laughs> she is mean, and she, we are very proud to say that through Cynthia, tough, 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 tough and fair, um, that through Cynthia's efforts, last year we got $19 billion investment in pollution control as a result of Cynthia's efforts, and that's a, that's a really good topic. Um, Thank you. Uh, I'm not usually introduced as a person who's mean. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I am privileged to head up the Office of EPA that enforces the existing standards uh, that protect health and protect the environment on which healthy communities depend. Uh, we work with states to take action to uh, get clean air and clean water and also to make sure that everybody plays by the same rules. So one of the ways we do this is by bringing cases. We bring cases uh, to ensure compliance with the laws from the largest, like the large power plants that have uh, pollution that affects millions of people, um, to smaller cases that protect local communities, like making sure that the drinking water systems are complying with the health standards. Uh, when necessary, we also bring criminal cases, um, as we did with the wastewater treatment plant operator who didn't see fit to operate his treatment plant as a result of which raw sewage was backing up into people's homes. And when they complained, he cut off their water. Um, and as we did in the case of a pesticide operator who uh, failed to follow the, re the requirements for use of these pesticides, as a result of which two young girls died, unfortunately. Um, we also do our work by taking advantage of the advances in monitoring and information technologies, uh, like requiring uh, companies to install fence line monitoring so that they can, the com neighborhoods and communities um, that host these facilities can know what the pollution problems are uh, that affect them and take action to protect their families and their communities. Um, and by doing this, we are seizing on the power of public accountability um, to have these facilities compliance improve. People in environmental organizations and responsible companies um, and in community groups like the people in this room have been key partners for us in doing this work. Um, partners by letting us know about violations uh, so that we can take action on them. Uh, by working side by side with us in litigation um, and letting us know what it is their communities need um, and also by speaking up uh, about the importance of clean air and clean water and protecting your families. Um, we also increasingly see people post things on YouTube so we encourage that. We found out some very cool uh, things on YouTube that have resulted in, in cases. Uh, I, I met last week with a representative from the Steelworkers Union. Uh, we were, got together to talk about uh, how EPA's work to protect clean air and clean water is creating green jobs. And she told me about the Women's Caucus that they've created in her union, which they've named Women of Steel, ah. uh, which I love that. Uh, as a mean person. <laughs> <laughs> Tough, but um, fair. But what, it, what it reminds me of is the importance of being tough 
and persistent in the important and challenging work that we have uh, to make our communities healthier places to live. So I, I thank you all for the inspiring work that you do and for being tough and persistent. Um, and to remind you, if you know about a violation, epa.gov slash tips. <laughs> Thank you, Cynthia. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce Michelle DePass, who's our Assistant Administrator for the Office of International and Tribal Affairs. Um, Michelle is a, well, she's younger, I think, than most of us. She's a mere <laughs> child, she, uh, but she's a long-standing community <laughs> activist. And she, in fact, started her career promoting seatbelts. And I dare say that in her position in the environment, in the international office, she is fastening a seatbelt around the world. And oh, we say thank right. you, Michelle. Thank you, Vicki. That's good. I'm going to use that. <laughs> Better volume. than mean. <laughs> so my New Jersey connection was that I used to work at New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. So yes, there is. Uh, <laughs> but you know, thank you for giving me the opportunity to be able to spend the morning with you because I get tremendous energy from women. It's the, it's the work that I started in, I'm working on asthma and issues in the South Bronx and Harlem, and it was the women whose children were suffering that really gave me my energy to get up every morning and to you know, um, continue my education in this work. And so I find myself very fortunate to be working with this incredible group of colleagues, working for you women in the audience, and also working for Lisa P. Jackson. So, as I was introduced, I'm the Assistant Administrator for International and Tribal Affairs. It means a lot more than I travel a lot. What it means is that I'm responsible for the work of the agency in working with 564 sovereign nations that are within our borders, our uh, Native American tribes, but also the work that I'm going to talk to you about today, very briefly, in about four more minutes, uh, working, <laughs> with, uh, working in six out of the seven continents and in 84 countries. So um, you probably don't have a lot of opportunity to actually hear about EPA's international work. We are a domestic regulatory agency. However, we've had a long history of international collaboration on a wide range of global environmental issues. But in recent years, in this administration, under the leadership of Administrator Jackson, we have given our bilateral and multilateral partnerships increased significance, particularly on environmental protection and children and global governance, governance. It's our vision that our work that we do is led by our domestic policy, but in the international arena, we can work on enhancing national security, increasing opportunities for trade promotion, uh, engaging, <laughs> of course, in the global climate change arena, and enhancing our diplomatic work. So I wanted to talk about just uh, three very quick areas that we work in, but there are many more, and I hope to engage with you in our breakout areas. And you know, we recognize that air and water travels, so we focus a lot of our work on key transboundary um, pollution issues. First, you heard Administrator Jackson <coughs> talk about mercury and the MATS rule. We have the opportunity to be able to take our work on mercury internationally. It was under this administration that we joined the global community in working towards a mercury, in, uh, international mercury uh, treaty, which we believe will be wrapped up in 2013 after some very intense and wonderful negotiations. And mercury is a prominent example about how we work in the multilateral arena, but we also work in the bilateral arena in partnerships towards emerging global challenges. Over the past three years, we've been working with Brazil and Peru, working on the ground to actually work on artisanal small-scale gold mining. Small gold shops can emit up to 16% of an emissions of one uh, coal-fired coal power plant in the U.S., a very small gold shop. We know that there are approximately 10 million miners and shop keepers that work in the small-scale gold mining industry. Many of them, most of them, are women, and many of them that are exposed, whether they're mining or they're living near these gold shops, are children. So we have partnered to actually come up with a solution to this. They're called mercury hoods. 
and we've worked with labs to be able to deploy them in some communities around the world. And we're looking to really scale up this initiative with the global community so that we could protect uh, women and children and have a direct impact on these communities worldwide. Nancy spoke about the Mexico, U.S.-Mexico border program, and it deserves a second mention. It is actually an incredible program that we've been working on since we signed the La Paz Agreement in 1983. So this also is not a new initiative that we've been working on, but again has taken increased significance under this administration. We will be launching the Border 2020 program because Border 2012, it is 2012, and we've wrapped up. Uh, 24 out of 25 goals have already been completed, and we'll be completing the last one before our launch of Border 2020 in August. Nancy spoke about the incredible water and wastewater infrastructure commitments under the border program. We also work to reduce air pollution from vehicles and increase energy efficiency. We are bettering waste management by increasing capacity for sustainable materials management. I don't know if any of you have ever visited border communities, but uh, one of the distinct uh, characterizations of a border community, you often see many, many tires stacked up. Uh, this is a problem that brings disease to communities and usually ends up impacting children first. So we have removed millions of tires from the border. Uh, and sh we have been working on joint emergency preparedness and expanding chemical safety practices. Since many of us are moms or we have younger brothers or younger sisters get on school buses, idling is one of the most important issues that we work on in communities. So through the border program, we've been working on something called the Texas Clean School Bus Program. And this program has resulted in retrofitting school buses in 14 districts that we share with Mexico. So we've retrofitted over 400 uh, school buses, and this has increased, in, this has increased uh, the opportunity for young children to not get exposed to these toxic emissions, and it's been a real success. That's just one of the 25 successes I could tell you of this past, year's border, this past few years' border program. Stay tuned for the Border 2020 program that will be launched in August. The final thing I want to talk about uh, in my remaining minute is trade and the economy. You know, we work on uh, local prosperity and environmental health issues at EPA. But we know right now growing our economy is our major, major concern in this administration. So at EPA, we work actively to be able to work on that, to promote that. We write the environmental clauses and requirements that go into trade agreements. So we're not only maintaining our social responsibility here, but we can also know that we're resting assured that our goods and services that transport across borders are safe for our families' daily use. Uh, aside from that responsibility, we also work on environmental uh, capacity building underneath our uh, trade agreements, such as NAFTA and CAFTA-DR. Uh, for example, due to an EPA collaboration with all the CAFTA-DR countries, that's Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, and the Dominican Republic, they have received environmental assessment training and have been provided with our NEPA assist technology. And this has resulted in an in increase in, in the improvement and efficiency of assessment processes, which again helps protect the trade between our borders and the goods that we use every day. So I could talk a lot more about the international side of the work that uh, incredible, dedicated staff that I have that I work with every day. But I look forward to uh, interacting with you in the course of the breakout. And of course, if you want to talk about tribal issues, I'd be happy to do that as well. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. And the last person on the, the last but not least person on the panel is Judith Enk, who's the regional administrator for EPA's Region 2 office, which heads up New York, Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico, and New Jersey. And um, <laughs> most recently, I, or at least, you know, one of the things that Judith has accomplished recently that I think was tremendously um, important was the settlement or resolution of an issue of PCBs in schools and lighting fixtures in Manhattan. Um, 
and the resolution of that was to remove the PCBs and replace the lighting fixtures with energy efficient lighting, which will save the school's money over time, so there's more money available for children's education, but also importantly, such a large amount of the population, children as well as faculty, as well as maintenance, et cetera, spend such a large part of their day in schools that if you want to have an impact on human health, that's that's a pretty good way to get it. So go ahead, Judith, please. Great. Thanks, Vicki. Good morning, everyone. So I've got the best region. <laughs> uh, not just because of New Jersey, um, and also eight Indian nations in New York, and it's really a privilege to be with you. There are countless, countless examples of women providing leadership uh, across the country. Vicki mentioned PCBs in schools. We're working with women in Puerto Rico to establish recycling programs, women in New Jersey to clean up the Passaic River and create jobs as part of that cleanup. But I want to spend my few minutes telling you a story. It's an air toxic story. Uh, pro you're probably not used to telling your kids when they go to sleep, listen, honey, I've got a story about air toxics. So, um, <laughs> so I'm going to tell you an air toxic story involving Tonawanda, New York, which is a small town just uh, north of Buffalo. Uh, where there's been a really serious um, host of environmental issues involving a company called Tonawanda Coke Corporation. It's a petroleum coke plant. There are only four of them left in the country, and um, it's a very old polluting industrial process. I won't go into a lot of details, but imagine a big piece of black cauliflower. Uh, that's petroleum coke. It's heated, the volatiles are burnt off, and then the end product, which is almost pure carbon, is sent to steel companies. So this facility has been a major source of pollution in Tonawanda, New York for decades, not getting a lot of attention. That changed about three or four years ago uh, when a group was organized called the Western New York Clean Air Coalition. They hired a very savvy young woman, Erin Heaney. You know, all know the drill. She was hired. A week later, she was told there was $400 in the bank account to the organization uh, and go change the world. And Erin is doing just that. She and her volunteers um, have knocked on over 500 doors. You know how hard it is to do door knocking and talk to people directly about environmental health issues because it's not always good news when you show up on someone's doorstep and say, I want to talk to you about a major source of pollution. Get to keep the door open, have the conversation, and hear from families about their struggles with asthma, leukemia, blood disorders. Uh, what this group has been able to do is put a face on this local pollution problem. I've gone to Tonawanda a number of times. I've walked through the neighborhoods. I have this striking image of my mind of standing there with community leaders next to a rusty old playground, seeing the stacks from this facility, and having a conversation with this amazing volunteer with the group. Her name is Jen. She has lived in Tonawanda. Uh, for decades. She has two kids, an eighth grader and a son in high school. Uh, she was recently diagnosed with leukemia. The first question her doctor asked her was, have you worked with benzene? Mm. And she said no, but she started researching the amount of benzene coming out of the stacks of Tonawanda Coke. We did some further investigation and found it was about 90 tons a year annually, every year, of benzene emissions. Uh, this inspired Jen as a volunteer to become active in this coalition, which has now grown to a staff of four people, all women in their 20s. Uh, these women decided to go and collect data. Uh, they did their own air sampling. They worked with a group you might know, the Bucket Brigade, uh, and they did their own sampling. They shared the data with elected officials, with the media, with regulators, and finally, government took action. Uh, EPA, I'm very proud to say, has filed a number of enforcement actions. We're working closely with the state of New York in this effort. Uh, the plant manager was arrested and is facing federal charges for violating federal environmental laws. The company, to their credit, has agreed to a number of pollution reductions at their plant. And here's the takeaway. The result is a 86% reduction in benz benzene emissions. Benzene, a carcinogen. And remember the question that Jen's doctor asked her when he shared the horrible news that she had leukemia. I saw Jen about three weeks ago and um, I asked her um, how she is doing. 
um, because I'm always amazed by these local environmental leaders who find the ability to deal with their own health challenges, the pressures on their family, and still speak out in their communities on a range of issues. Uh, the good news is she says she's feeling better. Uh, her treatment is going okay. Um, and I ask her, how does she find the strength to keep going? And she points to her daughter. And she <laughs> says she does this for her, da her daughter. She's very involved. In addition to working on this one polluting facility, EPA has launched a program called the E3 uh, program, which is Economy, Energy, and Environment. You should look it up, bring it to your community. Um, we are focusing on that because there are 52 air pollution sources within a two-mile radius in this community. And while we've put a lot of time and energy into this one polluting facility, it's not realistic that we're going to tackle all 52 air permits in the same way. So we've invited industry to come to the table. We have a sustainability coalition that includes the Chamber of Commerce, local businesses, the local government, state government, community leaders. We all have come together with the singular goal of improving air quality and reducing water pollution in Tonawanda. So when I, when I hear of these stories, I'm just so inspired. And for Jen, for her daughter, for our daughters and our sons, we absolutely have to get this right. And that's why um, having the strong uh, EPA presence, where federal EPA does really strong environmental standards, thanks to Gina McCarthy and Gina and Nancy and, and Michelle and others, in the, at the regional level, we get to enforce those standards, and we listen to communities. We can't do everything uh, that we're asked to do, and I'm reminded of the old saying, you can't do everything, but everyone can do something, mm -hmm. and that's what we were able to do in Tonawanda. Thank you. Thanks very much, all of you. Thank you. I'm just going to throw a couple questions at each of you, um, which, Nancy, could you tell folks about what you're doing with beaches? Because I think that's a really important um, factor that we don't necessarily think about in traditional EPA enforcement work. I know it's important to you in your office. Uh, sure. So what we've been working on is uh, updating the science uh, for the beach standards. So those are standards that protect people uh, uh, who are swimming from getting usually gastroenteritis, which is, of course, a fun thing to talk about in public. Uh, so uh, nobody wants to get that. You and can talk so, about factory farms. Yeah, <laughs> this, uh, all of my issues are sexy. Um, and so uh, what we've been doing, we've been doing a series of uh, 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 epidemiological studies to figure out um, what uh, level of pollution makes people sick. And we're working on updating those standards. And we have a proposal out now. Uh, and a number of you have commented on it. And we're looking closely at that. And we'll be fi finalizing those standards by the end of the year. Uh, to provide uh, better public health protection at beaches. And what's the impact going to be if you're deciding if you can go to the beach that day? Well, um, one of the things that we've been doing is validating a rapid test method. And so uh, what that will uh, do is uh, provide a quick uh, feedback for people so that you won't find out whether the beach was contaminated the day before, but whether it's uh, contaminated that day. Probably won't be used at every beach, uh, but at uh, uh, beaches that are uh, have a lot of people out there, uh, very uh, busy beaches, uh, uh, we now have a validated standard or will have a validated standard that people can use to provide that information right away. Thanks, Nancy. Um, Cynthia, I think it would be great if you could talk some about these um, settlements involving green infrastructure, because I think they're making such an on-the-ground difference in communities. Uh, I'd be happy to do that. Nancy and I are working closely together, as she mentioned, with enforcement and water, uh, trying to find ways that we can reduce the discharges of raw sewage into our waterways and backups into basements, um, and the contaminated stormwater that runs off uh, our streets and other surfaces. Um, and what we are doing is working with communities to find ways to use low-tech 
uh, green spaces in their own communities uh, that not only improve water quality, but create green spaces uh, that don't exist in many of these communities and also reduce energy consumption. So it's a, it's a triple win. And one of the things we're doing with these um, settlements is also encouraging facilities to look at uh, starting first in the communities that are most affected, so in the low-income communities and places where um, there's substantial amounts of abandoned properties, um, and to turn those uh, blights in the community into assets for that community and make these places uh, better places to live. So we're finding actually a lot of communities very interested in this, um, and we're working many cities, St. Louis, Cleveland, Kansas City, just to name a few, um, that we've been engaged with recently, and lots more on the way. Thanks, Cynthia. Um, Michelle, can you talk some about what you have been doing with the tribal community? Um, there are certainly some instances of them being on the front lines of increased precipitation, et cetera. Absolutely. Um, thanks for that opportunity. Uh, as I mentioned, we at EPA work with the 564 sovereign nations that are around the country. Uh, obviously, uh, between Region 9 and Region 10, which is the west going to Alaska, uh, there's a concentration of about 300 of them. Uh, so um, we have been engaged, obviously, with uh, the tribal EPAs very, uh, very, very intimately. We run a program called the Indian General Assistance Program, which is actually a program where, that dispenses resources so that we can actually partner with tribal communities. Uh, these are resources that build tribal capacity. Uh, under this administration, the President's budget has actually called for a $30 million increase to the IGAP funds, as we call it. The, you know, we're very familiar with acronyms in the environmental world. So the I, IGAP funds actually are critical to tribal communities, and uh, it enables them to set up uh, solid waste programs, and it enables them to uh, do air monitoring, uh, to be able to do water monitoring, and we really partner with them because they have jurisdiction over land, and air travels, water travels, and uh, they also have fee land and other sorts of jurisdictional arrangements where they have lessees, and some of them are industry. So we've been really uh, thinking through with them uh, environmental health and protection, and also with the increased growth in uh, natural gas production, oil and gas production. Tribes uh, tend to live on some of the sunniest and the windiest and the um, uh, uh, land that has some of the most mineral resources. So um, uh, they really are a partner with us, and we're working through those issues every day. Thank you. Um, and I'll also see if anybody else would like to pose a question, and maybe it'll hit Judith's PCBs and schools issues, or maybe something else of interest. Go ahead, please, in the black shirt. Ah, thank you. <laughs> Sure, and this is not a plant. Claire and I have worked <laughs> together for years. Um, a concerned parent was worried about PCBs and caulk. We are still looking at that issue. We're not sure that it's volatilizing. Uh, EPA signed a legal agreement with the City of New York uh, to look at the presence of PCBs in five schools. And um, in three schools, we did before and after air sampling and found that when we removed old lighting fixtures, the PCB levels in the air came way down. And it was sort of like, remember that old cartoon, the 80s are over and I forgot to have children? It, this was, um, of course, it's in the lighting. Um, so uh, I thought I could say that in this crowd. Uh, I say it all the time, and eventually people are getting my humor here in the federal government. Um, but. Um, we all know old lighting ballasts have PCBs. PCBs were banned over 30, 35 years ago. You can't put new PCBs in new products, but you're not legally required to remove them from old products unless they're leaking. So unfortunately, we went into a number of New York City schools. This is not just an issue in New York City. It's an issue in any old school building that has not upgraded their lighting. 
Um, and we did wipe samples, found high levels of PCBs in one classroom in Bushwick, Brooklyn, two samples, over a million parts per million of PCBs. So pure product. Basically what happens is the lighting fixture leaks, it's hot, the PCB is volatilized. The good news, if there is good news when you say the sentence PCBs in schools, and there is, the good news is the fix is um, replacing the lighting. So it's more energy efficient lighting. The, it'll become, your lighting will become 50% more efficient if you replace it. So you save tax dollars, you reduce exposure to PCBs, and you create jobs. So um, there is national guidance on the EPA website. Happy to talk to anyone about it. And this was very much a parent-led initiative. Okay, that's great. I think, do we have time for one more, or do should we? One, one, one more. more. Go ahead, please. Okay, can you, of the native, I couldn't really hear, what is the actual chemical you're talking about? Okay. Okay, well, Marcia, thank you for bringing that to my attention. As it was in 1996, I have not, it has not actually been raised to my level, and I'm not sure whether our office is actually working on this anymore. So what I would say is that I could follow up with you specifically on that. But generally, obviously, uh, decreasing our, decreasing exposure to toxic chemicals is actually one of our international priorities. And we have a number of programs that we work with through uh, memorandums of understanding and memorandum of agreements with a variety of our, our, our country partners on those issues. So um, I, you know, I'd be happy to learn more about that and to be able to follow up. But I have to say that's not one of the sort of top 100 issues that we're working on right now that's at the forefront of, of my memory. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much. We're going to, we don't have any more time for questions of these folks, but you will be able to talk with them during the breakout sessions. Um, thanks very much to this panel. The first installment of GPA. <laughs>